Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. أعوذ بالله السميع العليم من الشيطان اللعين الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على أشرف الأنبياء والمرسلين حبيب إله العالمين أبي القاسم المصطفى محمد اللهم صل على وعلى آل بيته الطيبين الطاهرين المعصومين المنتجبين صلى الله وسلم عليك يا رسول الله صلى الله وسلم عليك يا أبا عبد الله يا رحمة الله الواسعة ويا باب نجاة الأمة يا ليتنا كنا معكم سيدي فنفوز فوزا عظيما أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم ألف لام ميم أحسب الناس أن يتركوا أن يقولوا آمنا وهم لا يفتنون ولقد فتن الذين من قبلهم فلا يعلمن الله الذين صدقوا ولا يعلمن الكاذبين صدق الله العلي العظيم وصل على محمد وآل محمد When we look at history, and often a phrase which is frequented by historians and by Orientalists is that history repeats itself. When we say that history repeats itself, or when historians claim that history repeats itself, what is trying to be implied is that for the most part, human beings, humanity, since the beginning of creation, since the beginning of inception, have the same attitudes. They have acted the same throughout history. Specifically, when we look at Orientalists, those who study the history of, and when we say Orientalists, the Orient, anything east of Europe, the Middle East, this includes the study mainly of Christianity, Judaism, and especially in more recent times, Islam. What is meant by history repeats itself is the fact that no people, no society is exempt or acts differently throughout history. There's a pattern that is detected. Now, specifically, Orientalists say the following. They say that when you look at the history of any nation or any people, they say that there is no one who is exceptional. There are no exceptional people. For the most part, people act the same. And this assumption or this principle is called the principle of analogy. I know what people act like today. When I look at society, I can tell what people do, their inclinations, their desires, their agendas that they have, their personalities. And I could trace this back going hundreds of years or even thousands of years. And I can deduct the following that for the most part, people act the same. In the same way that you have people today who are greedy or who are driven by certain agendas. In the past, you have people who also were the same and there were no exceptional people. Now this is used as an approach, this principle of analogy, to study the origins of early Islam. Because when you look at early Islam, and we'll be discussing the history mainly that took place in early Islam, when we speak of Imam Hussein alayhi we're speaking roughly around the year 60 after Hijrah. This is considered early Islam. They say that early Islam, the history is written by whom? mainly by Muslims. There are no outside sources. So, for instance, one of the earliest accounts, the earliest complete accounts of the life of the Prophet Muhammad wasallam is Sirat ibn Ishaq. Ibn Ishaq was a biographer who wrote this biography roughly a hundred years after the Prophet. And this is the earliest account. 
And then people began to write from there. And people began to write detailed accounts. So when Orientalists, who don't come from that background, who are non-Muslim, they look to these accounts, they say that when you find a man, such as the Prophet Muhammad, who was described as being someone who was extraordinary, they say that these accounts don't prove anything. Why? Because history tells us that there's been no extraordinary people, let alone people who are infallible, let alone people who stand out. So they say that whenever a Muslim historian or a Muslim narrator narrates something which is extraordinary, then we should approach it with a skeptical point of view, meaning that it is assumed that it is unauthentic unless it can be corroborated from an outside source. Now, this may be true for the most part. There are arguments against this. And the reason why it is true to a certain extent is because truly when you look at history, uh, people have exhibited the same characteristics from the beginning of time. Look at the first human being who was created, Adam and his spouse which was created for him, Hawa, Adam and Eve. And then their children who came from them. The ones mentioned in the, in the Quran, referenced in the Quran, are Qabil and Habi, Cain and Abel. Cain was overcome by what? He was overcome by jealousy. This jealousy led him to commit an atrocity. He murdered his own brother. The Quran says that both of them offered sacrifices. The sacrifice of one of them, Habil, Abel, was accepted. The sacrifice of Cain was not accepted. This bore jealousy. This planted the seeds of jealousy in him. And this jealousy led him to murder his brother. So jealousy. We know that from the beginning of the time in the Islamic narrative, jealousy has always existed. Anger has also existed. Greed, miserliness, these are attributes which have existed since the beginning of time. Drawing upon that, these Orientalists and these historians, they say that there have been no extraordinary people because these attributes have existed since the beginning of time. And unless it can be corroborated from an outside source, then it's probably, it's probably not true. Now, here, in our belief, and this is drastically different than what we believe, we certainly, in Islam, especially in the school of Ahlul Bayt, believe that in every time, not sporadically, not, it, it's not something which occurs sometimes, it is something which exists from the beginning of time until the end of time, is the existence of people who are extraordinary. Now we won't get too deep into this. The Quran, for reference, the Quran refers to these people who are extraordinary, who exist within every time as a shahid, a witness. And on the Day of Judgment, he says, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, we shall call from every nation a witness who are the good, infallible people, the extraordinary people, to testify against their own people. This witness may be a prophet, may be a messenger, or may be a good believer. But this witness always exists, and he is an extraordinary person. But most people who are fallible, such as myself and such as you, they, for the most part, are driven by the same attributes. They have, for the most part, the same agenda, the same emotions which trigger us into motion, into effect. Hisham ibn al-Hakam, one of the companions of the seventh Imam, Imam Musa al-Kalam and among the first Shia theologians, says the following. When describing infallibility, he says that infallibility means the following. He says, when you look at any sin, sin or disobedience is caused by four things. Either envy, or either anger, or miserliness, or desire. So in his words, and he was a student of the seventh imam, a very close student, what he, what he preached was what he learned from the imam. 
He says any sin, in essence, can be traced back to one of these four things. Anger, jealousy, uh, I'm sorry, anger, envy, miserliness, or desire. He says these four attributes do not exist in those who are infallible. The prophets, they have no anger. They have no unnecessary anger. They have no anger that overtakes them, that causes them to sin. They have no greed. They have no envy. There is no one that they can be envy of. He says these do not exist when speaking of these um, extraordinary people, those who are infallible, such as the prophets and the imams of Ahlul Bayt. But for the most part, and I, again, I, I mentioned this, that we are not infallible. We follow those who are infallible, but we are prone to sin. We are prone to mistakes. Now, since these attributes exist, since the reason behind sin exists, then sin will always exist. Disobedience will always exist. Conflict was, will always exist. And it was conflict between these two brothers which caused this murder, this atrocity to take place. Conflict will always exist. However, conflict, whenever we say something, whenever we mention conflict, we always uh, presume a negative connotation. However, conflict, although initially it may have a negative connotation, we find that conflict is the foundation of every important change in society. When we look at people who were liberated from tyranny, that tyranny was a form of conflict. When we find nations who found freedom, that freedom didn't exist in the beginning. And they'll tell you, you know, in countries such as the United States, for instance, how many wars and how many battles were fought for the United States to gain its independence. There had to be conflict. There was a war of independence. There was a civil war. There were, you know, the, the, the Spanish war, this war and that. All of these were conflicts which ended up in, you know, the, the independence of the United States of America. Likewise with any other country that you go to. Initially, there had to be conflict, which has a negative connotation, in order for there to be freedom, in order for there to be you know, democracy, in order for there to be the freedoms that we enjoy today. So conflict is not necessarily, uh, it's not necessarily negative. And one purpose of conflict is to rectify the imbalances in society. So looking back, whenever we mention the revolution of Imam Hussein alayhi salam, we, whenever we relive this conflict, and even though within the first 10 nights of the month of Muharram, we touch upon certain subjects, certain issues which are relevant with the revolution of Imam Hussein. However, you find that it is customary that on the 10th day, in every society, any, any society which commemorates this tragedy, that on the 10th day, what do we do? We retell the story of what happened on the day of Ashura, the Maktab. This is important. It is important to constantly remind ourselves of this conflict. Because with conflict, with death, there is also birth. There is also renaissance. And the renaissance of Islam began with the conflict which took place on the day of Ashura. And that's why one important historian, he says, Al-Islam, Muhammadi al-Wujud, Husayni al-Baqa. That Islam was initiated through the person of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And it continued with the person of Imam Hussein alayhi salam. Had it not been for him, there would be no continuation of Islam. So when we speak about this conflict, when we speak about this revolution, it is important to remember the following. Whenever we speak of revolution, in the same way that conflict has a negative connotation, revolution usually means conflict. Now, when we learn about revolution in schools today, what do we learn? When we say revolution, we think of something which is political, something which is military. When they speak about the American Revolution or the French Revolution, why was the French Revolution significant? Because after you know, centuries of monarchy, finally the French people, they found their freedom and they established democracy. And then they, they took their democracy and they started to, it was so good 
that they had to export it to other countries as well. But revolution, when we say revolution, the first thing we think of is politics. Even, not only in the English language, in the Arabic language as well. What is the word for, which is associated with revolution in the Arabic language? Inqilab. When we speak about inqilab, revolution, to change, to revolve. Also, in other languages as well. The term which is associated with revolution is inqilab. Inqilab comes from what? What's the root verb of inqilab or root word of inqilab? Qalaba. Three letters. Qaf, Lam, Ba, Qalaba. And what does Qalaba mean? Qalaba means to flip, to turn over. So originally the word inqilab or Qalaba had a different connotation than it has today. Today we associate it with politics, we associate it with like a military revolution. But before, before contemporary times it wasn't associated with that. Even in the English language when we speak about revolution, before the revolutions, the word revolution did not have a political connotation. It meant nothing about politics. Revolution meant, one of the meanings was uh, something which revolves around something else, to move around something else, in, in the same way that the earth revolves around the sun. So, revolution in English, in Qalab in Arabic, and in different languages, initially, what is meant is a change. And the word in Qalab comes from what? Qalaba. And what's close to Qalaba? Qalb. And when we speak about the Qalb, the hadith says that the Qalb is called a Qalb because of its taqallub, because of its inconsistency, because it changes. So the word revolution, and you find this even in Christian literature, and the word inqilab in Arabic literature is associated mainly not with a change of policy, not with a change of society, but with a change of heart. So the original meaning, we cannot understand inqilab, or we cannot understand revolution apart from its original meaning, and that is a change of heart. What is more significant than a political change is the change of heart. And this is where a lot of people get it wrong with the revolution of Imam Hussein. They thought that it was just political corruption. That Yazid ibn Muawiyah, his father Muawiyah had appointed him and it was not his, his, uh, his right to do so. And then there needed to be a political change. So Imam Hussein said that for there to be a political change, my blood needs to be spilled. That's not correct. Imam Hussein wasn't concerned necessarily about the political change. It was about the change of the hearts. If you look at Islam, people, their mentality had shifted completely. They had shifted completely. And Imam Hussein was trying to say that in order for there to be a revolution, a change of heart, a change of soul, not only a change of politics, my blood needs to be spilled in order to wake the people. And that's exactly what happened. So when we're speaking about revolution, we're talking about a change of heart. We're speaking about a resolution as well. How many people, when the new year comes, and Muharram marks the new year of the Islamic calendar, they take on a New Year's resolution. You'll find people January 1st, they're all signed up at the gym. You know, and My New Year's resolution is to lose this much weight. Why? Because you're speaking about, about something which is new, something which is fresh, something which needs to be changed, something which is old and it needs to evolve. Something's gotta change in my life. When it comes to the revolution of Imam Hussein, one of the reasons why we commemorate it is because we can ask, is, is because we need to ask ourselves, something in my life needs to change. Something in society needs to change. And this is one important reason, this is what we should keep in mind. This is one important reason why we commemorate the message of Imam Hussein, because Imam Hussein, remembering him, reminds us that we need to change. Imam Hussein spilled his blood in order to wake up the people. People whose hearts were tainted with sin. People whose, whose hearts were tainted with greed and jealousy. People who had completely abandoned the message of Islam because the Sunnah of Rasulullah was completely obliterated. The Quran itself was completely forgotten. Just as Rasulullah said 60 years earlier that there will come a time in 60 years, he says that 
Three types of people will recite the Quran. Believers will recite the Quran. Hypocrites will re recite the Quran. And corrupt people will recite the Quran. And this is exactly the prophecy that, that took place. Had it not been for people like Imam Hussein alayhi salam, then we would not have known what the Quran is today. We would not have known what the pure sunnah of the Prophet was today. So keeping this in mind, that the revolution is not only a revolution, a political revolution. It's not only a permission to fight tyranny and to fight dictatorship. It is a permission and an injunction to fight the tyrant within ourselves. Each one of us has our own tyrant. Each one of us has our own dictator which resides within ourselves. And that dictator tells you to do wrong every day. This is, this is what, this is more importantly than, than, than getting rid of the dictators, the tyrants who oppress people, is to get rid of the tyrant within yourself. You cannot, because imagine, look at Imam Hussein alayhi salam when he rose up against Yazid. Imam Hussein wasn't the only person to rise up against Yazid. How many people rose up against Yazid and Banu Umayyah? Before and after. Al Mukhtar rose against Yazid. Abdullah ibn Zubayr rose against Yazid. People from Ahl al Bayt, they wrote. Uh, uh, Al Mukhtar, this came after Yazid. Uh, Abdullah ibn Zubayr rose up against Yazid. Other people from the Ahl al Bayt, they rose up against Banu Umayyah. Other people rose up against Banu al Abbas. What made Imam Hussein significant? What made him different? Just because he was the, the grandson of Rasulullah? No. Some of these people were the grandsons of Rasulullah as well. Some of them were from the family members of Ahl al Bayt. But Imam Hussein alayhi salam created a revolution within his society, within his own people. He himself was pure. There was no need for a change of hearts. His heart was completely pure. But those people who had claimed to follow him, their hearts were not pure. And he notified them of this many times. He wrote letters to the people of Kufa. He wrote letters to the people of Basra. In one letter to the people of Basra, he tells them that look at how the sunnah of Rasulullah has been completely obliterated. No one follows the sunnah of Rasulullah anymore. So Imam Hussein alayhi salam, with his pure heart and with his pure intention was a man who was fashioned for Ashura. And we remind ourselves that when we commemorate the message of Imam Hussein alayhi salam, number one, the first thing that we are doing is that we are setting the stage for personal reform. We're speaking of resolution. Make a resolution. Say, oh Allah, by the grace of Imam Hussein alayhi salam, this year I want to change something about myself. There's no use in commemorating Imam Hussein if you haven't changed anything about yourself. If you were mean before Ashura, if you were rude, if you, were, if you neglect your prayers, if you constantly listen to music, if, you're, if you backbite, all of that has to change in order for you to truly benefit from the message of Imam Hussein alayhi salam. Inshallah in the coming nights we'll reflect a little bit more on these points. Now, to conclude, I just want to reflect on one point. Because during this night, a night like this, uh, when the Imam, the night of the first of Muharram, the Imam was about to arrive in Karbala. He had left during the days of Hajj from Mecca, and he began his journey during the days of the Hijjah, and by the time it was Muharram, he arrived in Karbala. So, and then on a night like this, the Imam was nearing the city of Karbala. Now, a lot of people ask, why did Imam Hussein choose Karbala? Or why did he choose Kufa? Because his initial destination was Kufa. Why Kufa? Couldn't he have gone to other places? Historians have analyzed the options of Imam Hussein based on reality and based on what he said. Now, number one, when we ask the question, why did Imam Hussein choose Kufa? Because Muslim ibn Aqil was abandoned by the people of Kufa. Many of the people, not all of them. Imam Hussein himself was abandoned by the people of Kufa. So why did he choose Kufa? Why didn't he choose another city? We also need to ask ourselves, what other options did the Imam have? Now, where was the Imam before that time? Let's begin. He was in Medina. In Medina, Yazid ibn Muawiyah, upon ascending the pulpit, 
The first thing that he wanted to do was to secure the allegiance of the most important people in the Ummah. Among them, and the most important of them, was Imam Hussein alayhi salam. So he sent a message to his governor in Medina, and his governor in Medina went by the name of Walid ibn Utba. Al Walid from Banu Umayyah summoned Imam Hussein. And he wanted the allegiance of him, he wanted the allegiance of Abdullah ibn Abbas, he wanted the allegiance of Abdullah ibn Umar, and he wanted the allegiance of Abdullah ibn Zubair. Now, Abdullah ibn Zubair, he left. He said, I won't pledge allegiance. He went to Mecca and he wanted to begin his own revolution. After the day of Ashura, he was killed. The Kaaba was bombarded. It was destroyed. And, and, and he was killed and he was put down. Now, Abdullah ibn Umar, they said, he remained indifferent or he was not present in the city. Likewise, in the case of, of, of Abdullah ibn Abbas, he had left the city. The details are a little shadowy. But what is important is that Imam Hussein السلام, went to Al Walid. And Al Walid gave him an ultimatum. He said, Either I have my orders, either you pledge allegiance or you will be killed. And the person who was with Al Walid was Marwan ibn al Hakam. Marwan ibn al Hakam later became one of the Umayyad Khalifas. Not after Yazid, but after Muawiyah, the son of Yazid. So the fifth Umayyad Khalifa. <coughs> Imam Hussein alayhi salam, at this point he brought his closest people with him. He brought his family members and he took them to the palace of Al-Walid in Medina. And he went inside and he told them that I will never, don't ever think for a moment that a person like me will pledge allegiance to a person like Yazid ibn Muawiyah. He says, Inna Yazid and Rajulun Fasiqun Fajr. شارب للخمور راكب للفجور قاتل للنفس المحترمة ومثلي لا يبايع مثله. He says, look at Yazid. Yazid is licentious. He is deviant. He is corrupt. He's a womanizer. He's a gambler. He's a drunkard. He's a murderer. And a person like me, you expect a person like me, Hussein bin Ali, born of the pure house of the Prophet of Imam Ali and Fatima al Zahra, to put hand in hand with this man and pledge allegiance? Is this the audacity that you have? The Imam left. He knew that he had no place in Medina. And they threatened him with death. So what did he do? It was approaching the Hajj season, he went towards Mecca. He left early to go to Mecca. When he was in Mecca, Yazid ibn Muawiyah sent assassins for him. And that Hajj season, the Imam could not complete his Hajj. So he, he came out of the state of Ihram. He stood among his people. And he delivered a very powerful sermon. He said, He says that death has been prescribed to man. It sits and waits for a man the same way a necklace sits around the neck of a young girl. How appropriate it looks. You know, unless, unless it's, it's worn, a necklace, it looks more beautiful when it's worn than when it's you know, hanging in the, in the storefront, correct? He says, look at, look at how appropriate it is. Khutbal mawt. The same way it, has, it sits there on the neck of a young woman, death sits there for man. Meaning death is inevitable. And he says, I am longing for my ancestors. I am longing for my family members who have passed in the same way that, ya, that the Prophet Ya'qub was longing for his son Yusuf when he left him for so many years. At this moment, he removes his ihram and he begins his journey towards Kufa. Now why Kufa, people ask. Where was the Imam supposed to go? Was he supposed to go north to Damascus to Sham? That's where Yazid ibn Muawiyah was. Was he supposed to go south to Yemen? There was no protection for him there. There was no protection for him there. Although there were some followers of Ahl al-Bayt there, but there was no protection. There was no garrisons. It was not a protected city. And the same way that they had the audacity to, to intent to murder Imam Hussein in Medina and in Mecca. I mean, a person who has that sort of audacity, it won't be hard to murder him in Yemen, send assassins there. So he couldn't go to Yemen. He could not go to Egypt. Nobody had invited him there. He could not go to Basra. Basra had the people who fought against his father in the first civil war. He could not go to Persia. At that time, it, it had not been crystallized as a, a, a land of the followers of Ahl al-Bayt. Where was he supposed to go? The only place which received him initially was Kufa. They wrote a letter to him. 
They wrote letters to him. With historians say, they dispute amongst themselves, between 12,000 to 20,000 signatures. Come, Ya Hussein, we will protect you. So the only viable option for Imam Hussein was to go towards the city of Kufa. And that's why he set on his journey. He set on his journey towards the city of Kufa, and as we all know, he was deterred from his path and he ended up in the city of Karbala. Inshallah, in the coming nights, we will speak of the details of how Imam Hussein actually approached the city of Karbala and how he determined that this will be his final resting abode. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala <clears throat> to allow us to commemorate the nights of Ashura with full sincerity, with full ikhlas, with full awareness of the message of Imam Hussein alayhi We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to bestow upon us his mercy and his forgiveness. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to allow us to be among those who benefit from the message of Imam Hussein and those who are granted the intercession of Imam Hussein alayhi salam on the day of judgment. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Allahumma khfir al-mu'minin wa al-mu'minat wa al-muslimin wa al-muslimat al-ahyai minhum wa al-amwat taba' baynana wa baynahum bil khayrat innaka mujib al-da'wat innaka qad al-hajat innaka ala kulli shay'in qadir برحمتك يا أرحم الراحمين وصلى الله وسلم على سيدنا محمد وعلى آل بيته الطيبين الطاهرين